Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 131 of Sports Speak. I'm Eddie Kalegi. Tim Moore can't be here tonight, but that's all right. We will have Ethan Hoffman joining us in just a few minutes to talk about the NFL draft. It is draft day. Also, some big news. Aaron Rodgers is officially a Jet, and Lamar Jackson locked up long-term by the Ravens. We'll talk about that and break down the first round of the NFL draft and where we see these four quarterbacks going and what other surprises we could see in the first 31 picks but I want to start quickly next episode we'll dive deeper into the NBA with Tim but the NBA playoffs have been fun so far and I just want to give three key takeaways that I have from the playoffs so far number one Jimmy Butler is incredibly undervalued what Butler was just able to do is remarkable first eight seed to beat a one in 10 years, takes down the Bucs in five games, eliminates them on their own floor in Milwaukee, has that incredible falling backward shot to be able to force overtime and then takes over. And this is after a game where he had 56 in game four, the fourth most points in a game in NBA playoff history. Butler has now done this three of the last four years, taking Miami teams that are good, but definitely not great and making them elite in the Eastern Conference playoffs. In the bubble, he was masterful. Last year, took a Heat team that I don't think anybody thought was necessarily going to the conference finals, and they forced a game seven with the Celtics, who almost beat the Warriors for the chip. And then this year, takes down the Bucs, and now they have a manageable path facing off with the Knicks next. A old rivalry renewed, going to be a fun series. Knicks have been very impressive as well with Jalen Brunson, Julius Randle, R.J. Barrett coming into form so far in the first round. But uh, this is going to be a fun series, but Butler... I know he doesn't do all that much in the regular season, but hey, the fact that he plays all those games, he's not load managing compared to some of these other stars, yet he saves the best in the tank for last when it matters in the playoffs. I think it's just really incredible and so cool to see what Butler has been able to do. And we talk so much about LeBron and Curry and Durant for obvious reasons, but Jimmy Butler really has to join the conversation very soon. Second thing, the Kings had their chance. They could have taken down the Golden State Warriors, but they could not. That game against the Dubs when Harrison Barnes had an open look for three to win it, they could have gone up 3-1. Barnes could have had his little revenge against his former team, but instead, the beam will not be lit. They've dropped three straight. De'Aaron Fox is now playing through an injury. Sabonis hasn't had his best series. Still kudos to the Kings. Great to see them on the national spotlight. Mike Brown, deserving coach of the year, has had an incredible season with this team. That's a bonus for Halliburton trade. Really a win-win, and I like the way the Kings roster is constructed for future years. And as we said, and as I said when the playoffs started on our last episode, typically teams, their first time, their first try in the playoffs, don't succeed. I think that's what we're going to see with the Kings. Experience matters for Golden State. But my third takeaway The Suns are still the favorites. I think Phoenix taking care of business in five. Kevin Durant hasn't had to do that much now with this team. Very similar to the Golden State team. Booker is leading the way scoring-wise. Had 45 points in the clincher. Chris Paul's looked good so far. Aiton's had a nice postseason. This was against a Clippers team that's strong no matter who's on the floor. They beat a healthy Kawhi once, were able to split those games. And then once Leonard was hurt, they got through. And I just don't see much resistance in the West. The Warriors are vulnerable. The Lakers, though I think they'll beat Memphis, don't know how much is there. And Denver has never proven it in the later stages of the postseason. So I think Phoenix is the easy favorite out of the West. And the East now with the best team out. Boston hasn't looked great against Atlanta. Philly is unproven. Miami does not have much beyond Jimmy Butler. And the Knicks are the Knicks. So I I really see the Phoenix right now as the clear-cut favorites, I picked them to win the finals before the playoffs started, and I think they've proven it through this first-round series. So that's my little take on the playoffs. Uh, we will transition now to Ethan Hoffman joining us to talk some NFL draft. Well, continuing here on Sportspeak, I'm Eddie Kalegi. As we said earlier, it is NFL Draft Day, and joining me now is someone who really follows the draft. He just posted his mock draft we're going to talk about in a couple of minutes. Ethan Hoffman, thanks for joining us here on Sportspeak. Thank you for having me. So, of course, the thing we got to start with is Lamar Jackson. Just an hour ago, the news comes out. He is now the highest paid quarterback, surpasses Jalen Hurts, at least for now. That'll probably change again when Joe Burrow gets his contract. But Jackson now returning to Baltimore after requesting a trade and getting OBJ, five-year deal, $185 million guaranteed. 
and all the good quarterbacks seem to be in the AFC right now. So uh, yeah. what's your feelings on this and kind of this complete turning of the tide that now Lamar Jackson is going to indeed stay in Baltimore? You know, as a, as a Browns fan, it's not, not the best thing, him staying in the AFC North, but I'm glad he got paid. I felt like um, he was he was getting undervalued by a lot of teams. Uh, obviously, nobody wanted to go after him when they, they signed the non-exclusive tag. Uh, I'm just glad that he got, he got his pay's worth. So then the other big news this week, of course, Aaron Rodgers, he announced it on McAfee a month ago that he was going to the Jets, but like they had to do a trade first, and <laughs> it did happen. Finally, Jets give up a lot. Uh, They do have that little conditional pick in 2024 where it moves to a first, depending on how many games Aaron Rodgers plays as kind of a safety valve, I'd say. But Rodgers goes to the Jets. I watched his press conference yesterday. He's already on the field with Lazard. And the Jets showed some promise last year with an iffy quarterback situation with Zach Wilson and Mike White. And now you have young defenders, young receivers. Hopefully the offensive line can stay healthy. But in a tough AFC East How good of a move do you really think this is? And after Rodgers had a down year last year, what do you really make of the Jets with this move? You know, I think a lot of people are saying this is a win now move. I think this helps them in the future too. I think Zach Wilson is an underrated winner of this trade, right? I think the similarities between him and Rodgers, I don't think they get talked about enough. They're both kind of West Coast kids that kind of came up through the drafts kind of out of nowhere, right? Rodgers was sort of, it kind of blew up his last year. Um, I think if he can learn under Rodgers, right, I, the Jets, they could be set up for the next 10, 15 years. But the thing is, I mean, how much faith do you really have in Zach Wilson at this point? And how much do you think he's going to buy in here? Because he really thought this was going to be his team after he was drafted early in the draft two years ago and then gets benched last year after the weird comments after the Patriots game. And then now, I mean, his replacement was essentially traded for. So do you really think the relationship is going to be that strong between Rodgers and Wilson, at least starting out? I think it being Rodgers probably would is better than if it was Lamar or say any other quarterback, say they signed a veteran quarterback. Um, Zach Wilson said he grew up admiring Aaron Rodgers. He grew up with posters on his wall and that was his favorite quarterback growing up. That's who he wants to be like. I feel like he's more likely to sit and learn and develop uh, how to play football under Aaron Rodgers than if it was anybody else. So let's get to the draft. So the draft this year is interesting because you have four quarterbacks that are highly billed, but I think they are all flawed in different ways. Bryce Young's size is a question. CJ Stroud's ability to win big games. And of course, the tradition of Ohio State quarterbacks not necessarily panning out in the NFL is a concern. Will Levis got beat out by Sean Clifford for the Penn State job. And Anthony Richardson just doesn't have that much experience as a college quarterback, but they all have some unique assets as well. I'll start with what Tim shared with us. You can see it all on Twitter at Sportspeak Live. He didn't give me his full picks, but for the quarterbacks, he thinks Bryce Young's going number one to the Panthers. He has Stroud going to Levis four to the Colts, and he has Richardson being the one that slips to 11 and goes to the Titans. Now, last night uh, at Rutgers, uh, my radio station, we do a mock draft every year where we like each pick a few teams and we do the drafting. The quarterback that slipped was Levis. It was Richardson who went four, Stroud went two, and Young was number one. And I was looking at your mock draft and you have CJ Stroud as being the quarterback that slips out of the top 10. So what's your explanation there, especially with I believe you have Anthony Richards. Where, where do you have Richardson? Richardson's early, I know, for you as well. I think I had him maybe at, let's look. I believe I had him at three with the Colts. Um, No, I had him three with the Titans. I had the Titans trading up. I, it seems like they uh, kind of bind in. They're kind of out on uh, Willis, and they kind of want to – sounds like they want to trade up for a quarterback. So, but the decision of Richardson over Stroud, I'm curious there, because my concern with Anthony Richardson is that he just hasn't gotten that many reps on the field, was only a starter for one year. Of course, the athleticism's there, and there's a ton of upside, but the Titans already kind of tried that with Malik Willis, someone who I think there was more upside uh, potential, and we didn't really see that last year, and they did just draft a quarterback. So Mm -hmm. what's your thought process here? of A, them trading up, and B, going with Richardson over Stroud? I think when you look at Malik, right, when he ran at Liberty, he threw the ball maybe six, seven times a game. At least with Richardson, you know he has 
uh, high caliber arm that you could work with. I think Willis had less so of that and was more the run first. You know, hopefully he could develop his arm. But uh, Richardson kind of already has all those tools. He just has to get his accuracy down and he has to get more reps, which, I mean, he could sit under Tannehill for another year or two. I, I think Tannehill's got, I think, two more years left on his contract. Yeah. Yeah, so he can sit under Tannehill, learn under him, and um, I think he kind of fits that offense. That offense that they run, they kind of like running the ball down people's throats and running up the middle. Richardson would be perfect on that. Read options. I know they talking about trading Derrick Henry, but say they keep Henry, uh, I think that'd be pretty fun. Read options with the King. So we're recording this about two and a half hours before the draft is going to happen. So of course, if this gets uploaded and things change, uh, we, we you'll you'll know. But in this situation, of course, as of right now, the Cardinals have not traded the number three pick. In your mock draft, they do. And Tennessee is the team that trades all the way up here to number three, which is a big move. So I'm just curious how much you think the Titans would kind of have to give up in that situation to be able to get all the way up there. I know the Cardinals are shopping the pick, but that is a big leap for the Titans to go all the way up to number three. Yeah, so it's probably – it'll probably have to be the first this year, the first next year – you probably have to throw in maybe uh maybe a late two, early three the next next year, and then they'll probably do a pick swap with a fifth or a sixth round pick. So what happened, which was funny, obviously this will not happen now, but in our mock draft last night, I was the Titans, another group was the Ravens. Titans ended up with Lamar Jackson. I ended up pulling off that trade with uh first this year, first next year. I think it was a third this year and Ryan Tannehill for Lamar. And then the, the Ravens ended up being the team to draft Will Levis. So let's talk about Levis. Now you have him going number four to the Colts. I agree with you there. It seems pretty obvious that the Colts like Will Levis a lot and they want to go with a young quarterback after these last few years where they've kind of just been picking up someone who was experienced that didn't get signed by anybody else. And it hasn't worked out. And the Colts do have a good framework. They've got a good defense with DeForest Buckner and everyone else and Shaq Leonard. Of course, Jonathan Taylor had a down year last year, but a historic 2021. In the AFC South, besides Jacksonville, probably not going to be very good again this year. But what do you like with Levis? Because the question with him is the fact that I feel like his college numbers don't necessarily jump off the table. And the big thing is Sean Clifford, who is in this class, was not a great college quarterback. Uh, Levis lost the job at Penn State to him. Mm. Uh, well, first, I think the Colts are going to take him. That's just such a Chris Ballard move, right, as a quarterback like that. I think they tried out with Carson Wentz and uh, Matt Ryan, kind of that pocket passer. They don't really want dudes that can – I don't know. I feel like they value more pocket passers like that. And then with his numbers, if you look at it, his O-line this year was awful. I think he only had one uh, player on his offensive line that played every single game, and his receivers sucked. I mean, he lost his main uh, target, Wondell Robinson, last year to the draft, and he's none of these guys are going to get drafted high besides maybe Tavion Robinson, who's probably a day three prospect at best next year. So let's talk about the receivers now. Uh, so you have uh, Jackson Smith and Jigbo going number 13 to the Packers, which I think the Packers are going to draft a receiver, which is just really funny. After a decade and a half of them not drafting them in the first round for Rodgers, they'll do it for Jordan Love. Um, but Smith and Jigbo is probably the best one out there. Uh, I did notice you have Zay Flowers going to New England at 21 and kind of jumping up the draft boards. I like Flowers. I saw him when he played against Rutgers last year, uh, really carried that Boston College offense that really had nothing else there besides they were so Flowers, bad. hence why Rutgers was able to beat them. So uh, what do you like with Flowers? And how do you think he would fit into the New England system if they did go with him as a first rounder? You know, right with Flowers, you're not getting – uh, his catch radius is kind of small, but he separates. That's his thing is he can separate. And I think Belichick has always kind of valued dudes that can separate Julian Edelman. Gronk was a great separator. Um, his separation skills, really. I think that's that's what's going to put uh, Belichick kind of over the moon with him. And he is undervalued, but the Patriots always get undervalued dudes. That's how they they draft. They don't care about perception, media perception, or other teams' boards. They kind of pick with how they want with whatever pick they have. Let's go to the defensive side of the ball now. So undisputed, I think the most talented defensive player in this draft is Will Anderson Jr. And he's been tied to the Texans a lot and you've got him at two. I agree with you there. I think the Texans are not going to draft a quarterback just the way this 
class is gone. And next year, they'll, if they're really bad, they'll have a chance of Caleb Williams, who I think is a better prospect than any of these four guys potentially right now. But talking to the other two that have kind of slipped on some people's draft boards, Jalen Carter, of course, uh, behavioral, I think, has been part of the concern with him falling down to number five. But uh, Tyree Wilson is probably very interesting because pro football focus in some ratings earlier on had him as the second best draft prospect. Then he's kind of fallen back. You have him going number 10 to the Falcons. Uh, I'm just curious what your opinion is on that with Wilson, because he's been kind of very Jekyll and Hyde throughout this stretch. What are some of the assets with him? And what are some of the drawbacks that are kind of pushing him down from being arguably the best defensive player in the draft with Anderson to now a fringe top 10 pick? When you look at Wilson right now, he's an undeveloped pass rusher. You, first time he's playing, he's going to be awesome at run defend. I mean, his arm length is insane. I think he has the same wingspan as Giannis, which kind of shows how freak athlete he is. But a report came out just probably about two, three hours ago that with his uh, broken foot, uh, teams are worried about his medical. So he might even fall past 10. I think some people are talking about he could be one of the big round one slides. Um, I think they're real worried his foot isn't healing the way it should. Let's go to the secondary now. Uh, Witherspoon and Gonzalez, they are hyped up as the two best corners, and you've got them going six and seven. Uh, you have Witherspoon going a, a pick ahead of Gonzalez. You have Witherspoon going to the Lions, Gonzalez to the Raiders. Uh, Witherspoon coming from Illinois. My concern with him is that the numbers, at least statistically beyond last year, weren't all that great. He had an incredible year with Illinois last year. But let's also remember who their competition was. They're playing the Big Ten West, which does not have good quarterbacks. So uh, do, what led you to your decision here to rate Witherspoon as the higher corner than Gonzalez? Well, personally, I think I like Gonzalez better. Honestly, I think Gonzalez has he's taller. He's got that lanky corner that I think people uh, teams like. Um, I think the Lions just like uh, Witherspoon better. I think Witherspoon, he reminds me a lot of Darius Slay. And I think the Lions, you know, they were pretty heavy on Darius Slay a couple years ago when they drafted him. And um, I think Witherspoon fits what the Lions need right now more than Gonzalez, right? The Lions picked up a bunch of corners and they picked up corners that are more similar to Gonzalez, how he plays, where Witherspoon is more of a zone, can play in the nickel if he has to, can drop back, can play man. He can do everything. Where Gonzalez is more of a man-to-man, -man. he's kind of struggles in the zone. Let's talk about America's team now, the Dallas Cowboys. They have the 26th overall pick. There's been a lot of criticism over their first round picks over the last couple of years. Now, last night, uh, Cowboys were one of the teams I was drafting for. I took Jameer Gibbs 26th overall, and I got absolutely heckled over it by a Cowboys fan who was like, Michael Mayer was on the board and you just took Jameer Gibbs. Now I noticed you also took Jameer Gibbs. Mayer was gone, but Dalton Kincaid was still on the board. So both of us were in a similar situation. There was one of those two first round caliber tight ends and we went with the back over them, the number two back because Bijan Robinson was gone. The Cowboys are not getting Bijan Robinson and they're not going to trade all the way up to get him. That is very, very unlikely. But my theory is this. I know the Cowboys need a tight end because Dalton Schultz is gone. Ferguson looked pretty good down the stretch last year. And the thing is, people keep talking about, well, both Mayer and Kincaid, they're not just pass catchers. They're also blockers. Well, you need, if you're going to use a blocker, you need someone who can run the ball. Ezekiel Elliott's gone. Tony Pollard got hurt in the last game last season. You don't know if, how healthy he's going to be to start next year. And this is a Cowboys team that is not really looking multiple years in the future. They're looking for right now because the NFC is pretty weak. And if the Eagles take a step back, Cowboys could be the favorites in the whole conference. So, like, they, they want to win now. And I think Gibbs, we just saw the Chiefs with Isaiah Pacheco win a Super Bowl with a rookie running back that wasn't necessarily hyped up in his class. So that's why I went with Gibbs. Uh, I'm wondering if you had a similar theory there. I just like the idea of giving Dak more weapons. Right, Jameer Gibbs, you can hand him the ball off, but his main – what he's basically going to do is going to be those kind of uh, wheel routes where you throw it to him. I think he's uh, very similar to Alvin Kamara in that sense. He's very uh, pass-catch focused back, not really a, a run down the middle, run between the uh, numbers back. I, I I just like giving Dak more weapons. Right now he has CeeDee Lamb. Um, who else does he really have to throw to, right? Dalton Schultz is gone. Um Zeke out, yeah. Zeke 
off the team. You got um right uh, like you said, uh Pollard's gonna be out for a while. His ankle looked real messed up. Yeah, yeah. So that's why, like, you know, you go from two running backs to potentially zero. You kind of need one because their only other backs in the roster right now are Malik Davis and Ronald Jones. Uh, and neither of them really are all that flashy for a Cowboys team that wants to compete for a championship. Last two things. Of course, this show with me and Tim, there's a lot of focus on the Giants and the Eagles. We'll start with the Giants here. You and Tim both went receivers in the first round. Tim wants Jordan Addison 25. You had Addison on the board. You went with Quinton Johnston out of TCU 25, and Addison ended up slipping to the Chiefs. So uh, what to you gives Johnston a little bit of the edge over Addison? I think, right, when you look at the Giants receiving uh, core, it's a lot of smaller kind of uh, receivers similar to Addison, where Johnson is that alpha, that he's a 6'1", jump ball, uh, go grab him, go deep receiver. He's not a uh, kind of every down throw to like uh, like an Addison would be or like any of the receivers that are on the Giants roster right now. And then finally with the Eagles. So as an Eagles fan, what I really want to see is Bijan Robinson. You went with Paris Johnson with the eighth overall pick to tackle. Now, I will admit as an Eagles fan, the offensive line is aging, and we don't know how long they're going to stick around. Lane Johnson had to play with, through a lot of injuries last year. Kelsey's going to be entering his 14th NFL season. But the Eagles have had success I mean, not to, not counting Lane Johnson, but finding offensive linemen deeper in the draft. Jordan Mailata is a perfect example. He wasn't even a football player. He was a rugby player in Australia, and he became an elite offensive lineman. And I feel like the Eagles, almost in a similar situation to Dallas, I know they have backs in Gainwell and Scott still on the roster. Neither of those guys are really a number one. I don't feel that way with Rashad Penny either. So I feel like Bajan Robinson, to replace Miles Sanders, would be the right move what's your thoughts on the Eagles taking a tackle there at eight? See, I, uh, I went between either a uh, tackle. I wanted defensive end and then Bijan. I didn't go Bijan. I don't think Roseman is as high on running backs this early in the draft. Um, and then defensive end, right. You see Tyree is slipping. And then with Nolan Smith, the other best defensive end, I think he's uh, too similar to what the Eagles already have. Right, they have uh, uh, oh my god, I'm blanking on his name hard. How am I blanking on his name? Oh my god, wait, you mean defensively? Yeah, defensive end. Oh my god, and they got Josh Sweat and Hargrave, Brandon Graham, Fletcher Cox, whatever. The Eagles have a lot of guys, yeah, they have a defensive end that's very similar to Nolan Smith, uh, so. I can't believe that's embarrassing. I can't believe I'm blanking on his name. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, we, we, we've we established that the Eagles have an elite defense and they drafted two defensive players very early in the draft last year in Jordan Davis and Nicobe Dean. And neither of them got a ton of reps because the Eagles just had so much depth. I know they lost some of those depth pieces this year, but uh, they're certainly there. But that, yeah. I kind of hope for a back. We'll see what Howie Roseman does. He's not been mm -hmm. the best when it's come to drafting, but I can't complain. They did make the Super Bowl this past year. But uh, Ethan Hoffman, thanks a lot for joining us here on Sportspeak, and uh, we'll see how the NFL draft goes. All right. I'm excited. So that will wrap up this episode of Sportspeak. Reminder, follow us on Twitter at Sportspeak Live. Our NASCAR Pick'em is there. I got my first top 10 of the season finally because Brad Kozlowski finished fifth at Talladega. So you can follow along with that at Sportspeak Live. Next week, talking some NBA playoffs with Tim Moore. Won't want to miss that. But until next time, I'm Eddie Kalegi. This is Sportspeak. Enjoy the weekend and enjoy the 2023 NFL Draft.